Now that you've spent the entire month learning about hamstring conditions via podcasts as well as daily videos, I'm going to show you the entire compilation here. This is a long video, but don't forget these are all important and can be positioned strategically within a program to make a lot of hamstring conditions better. Don't forget to go see your doc and get this thing programmed up and you'll be extremely happy that you had the help from the start. Here we go. Now the reason why I'm on the ground is because we're going to do a stability based exercise for the hamstring. Yes, it's going to be on the ground, it's going to be on your back, and it's going to seem like a really crappy core exercise. But the reason why this is important because we have the concept of proximal stabilization for distal mobility. You cannot have a fully functioning hip or hamstring unless you have proximal stabilization which controls the pelvis, which controls the ilium, which controls the hip which controls where the hamstring is at too, okay? Everything in the middle is the boss. Everything down that way is secondary effect. So what we're gonna use, we're gonna use this kettlebell today, and I'm gonna use a 35 pound kettlebell. Yes, I said pounds. I don't wanna go with kilos. I don't believe in the kilo, okay? So here's what we're gonna do, and I'll slide around and make sure I'm in the video. All right, where are we at? Okay, so the reason why I picked this poundage is because as the, hot, the heavier the weight, the more I have to actually stabilize to drive it up, okay? So I'm gonna take this first, we're gonna roll this manner to make sure it's safely picked up, okay? Our torso is together. We're gonna double hand drive and lock out, all right? Now, I can make this really passive or I can just drive the hell out of it to the ceiling. I want that drive the hell out of it to the ceiling, okay? You're gonna notice that when you do this, your torso gets really stiff. And I'll pull my shirt up just so you can see not trying to flash anybody, but so I can be really lax right here in what we call open scissor position. I see the rib cage flare, or I can drive this thing to the ceiling, and all of a sudden now I'm really locked out and this thing's hard, okay? Now, what we're gonna do, and actually pull up again to make sure that you see, so this is called a dead bug exercise, all right? We're basically gonna have the legs lower and keep this thing engaged by driving this weight through the ceiling. Now you can do legs only, or you can do arm leg opposition. That's opposition or the same side. Now here's some faults that we typically see. When people, people typically reach long, and I'm gonna move the hand just so you can see. They reach long and they send to flare and see my abdominal area flaring. If I drive this thing down, it'll keep it locked in. But also too, the goal is to have the furthest distance, you can keep the knee bent, the furthest distance while keeping this thing driven down. Again, I'm gonna drop this, bring this thing down just so you can, just so I can explain it to you. If you do not have stabilization here, you cannot have a properly functioning hamstring at all. Number one goal, keep this thing together, okay? Double arm drive it, you can switch sides if you want to. I highly suggest you do both. Drive the hell out of it to the ceiling. Bring the heel to the ground. I still have the knee bent and this is hard enough for me, okay? Notice my abdominal area. If you see any fluctuations in my abdominal area, then I got some problems and I should just not go as far, okay? I like to do this for about a minute at a time. When you bring it down, double hand, roll it over. You should never have your shoulder in a compromised position. Now this lateral wedge is a great way to begin to learn to set your torso for side bridges as well as side planks. Because if people can't do those, a lot of times their shoulder hurts or they just can't hold position. Remember, position, pattern, and power. That's what they talk about at core performance, which I really, really, really like, okay? So here's how we do it. I'm gonna cut my head off with it. Now we can go straight line from the wall right here, but a lot of times if I'm working with athletes, I like a little bit of setback because we're gonna be driving this way rather than straight sideways a lot of times. But for the point of the video, we're gonna do a really wide stance and stick on the line, okay? Elbow up right here, parallel, parallel, knee bend, hip back, athletic position, hand right here to make sure you're, that you're monitoring your pressure. Deep breath. And we're gonna raise that left foot, the one closest to the wall, and not change position while we have that one section up. When you pick this up, you're gonna notice your right side has to do work and your left side here tightens and relax. 
So I like to do this for less than 10 seconds because it's easier to hold position. We want solid position before we start adding in speed, load, and power. Now the last video we did a lateral wedge with the outside leg as the driving one. Now when I like to teach a crossover, a lot of times we advance this to pushing or pulling a sled with a crossover, but that requires movement and a little bit more control. So to find proper foot position, I like to use something like a wall. Here's how we do it. I like to use this a lot of times with people who have hamstring injuries, number one, because a lot of times we have to get the hip involved. Two, I like to rehab ankles like this, and a lot of times people who have back pain in athletics, oftentimes they have, they have issues keeping this pillar system intact. Now here's what I like. We have a line right here. You're gonna take this back foot, push it back behind the line a little bit, okay? So I'm about this far behind the line. Next, add this right here. This this, don't change. Now, I like to have people just kind of feel things out first with this outer leg. Knee bend, hips back, solid, pick up, and drive the pole, not this way, but that way. Remember, we're behind this line. So, we're gonna get a little bit more push that way because we're moving forward. And you're gonna see that I've got more pressure on here than the heel. Okay, that's one. Now, the crossover, it's that same thing, except for now we're using the inner part of the leg. Again, we have this line, come back from a little bit, knee, hip, set it. And I wasn't far enough out. Now we're gonna set that same lean and learn how to drive off that inner foot because we know that speed kills. So don't lose posture with here, don't lose posture with here. Take a deep breath, do it less than 10 seconds because I want to pinpoint perfect, impeccable form every time. Today we're going over a way to load a single side or a single hip in a hip hinging pattern. You may know one hip hinging pattern called the deadlift. We're gonna show you that today. This is called a kickstand deadlift and it's not a single leg, it's not a Romanian, it's not a straight legged, we're just predominantly loading one side slightly with lighter weight to make sure that we're actually using that side so we have equal power throughout our athletics and if we have a hamstring injury, it's gonna help a ton. Now, consider, so a kettlebell deadlift right here, and we don't even have to, you don't have to see my head with it. So I like to hold like a penguin holding an egg, come out to the side a little bit, push the hips back, and I'll do it from this angle now. Push the hips back, hips high, deep breath, show the collar right here, crush oranges. So when we crush this here, we're creating a, what we call a lap pec strategy. We're creating compression as well as stabilization in the torso. Now for a two armed or two legged deadlift, I like to deep breath and drive tall. Oftentimes for safety, I like people doing it off blocks. For the video, we won't bother today. Notice that I put it down in the same exact position that I started with, okay? Next, if we're going to a kickstand, and I'll do it with this side, it's basically just like this. It's like you're kickstanding a car, okay? We're not gonna put weight on this thing because it's gonna shift us away from our position. We're just using it for balance. So I'm gonna take the same exact approach. Come down, show the collar, crush the oranges, deep breath into the belly, create pressure. <sighs> Control gravity on the way down, push it down, don't let gravity take you down, okay? One more time. Know your strategy when you come up, slide down, show the collar, crush the oranges, deep breath, into the hip, or in, into the sides or belly, drive high, push the feet through the ground, crush a quarter between the cheeks on the way up, control gravity on the way down. I like to do both sides, keep posture. This is exactly the same as doing a Romanian deadlift. However, kickstanding isolates one side better, don't forget to use lighter weight. This is, a, this is a predominantly patterning exercise. We're not gonna blow everything out of the water. Now an active hamstring stretch is one we're gonna go into next. And I like active or dynamic more so than passive. And you see how far she got here. I actually had to retract her back. Now this is okay, by the way. So you might wonder how flexible is too flexible. And this is just the amount of flexibility she has. She grew up as a gymnast. so. As long as she can control it on her own, with her own trunk, stabilizing, and no one pressing her into it, I have no problem with that. And if she's running, really the only range of motion we're looking to keep 
is the amount that we're, that she needs to go through normal gait. It doesn't really take an absurd amount of hamstring flexibility, but in this case, this is what she has. So she is actually a higher risk of injury. I don't know if you know that. More flexibility sometimes means increased risk of injury. So she needs to be able to control it by herself, which means active stretching. So let's go through what most people will look like. So you're going to engage the trunk, drive the foot towards the sky, and you'll probably get to 90. Hold it there for a couple seconds, and then you're going to come on down. But again, this range of motion right here would be ideal. It would be nice. Most people don't need it. Hamstrings in runners are typically tight anyways, but it has to be normal for the person's gait pattern. Spend about a minute or so. Now, the next thing I like to do is to load the hamstrings eccentrically or in a lengthening pattern. A rocking lunge is a good way to do it. So she's diving her hips back towards her heel, and you see she has the, the trunk or the torso bending forward. She's not rounding. Okay, let me reiterate that. She is not rounding forward. She's very flexible, as you saw in the last video, so she can get a little bit more out of this than most people. But the knee is straightening, the hips are diving back. You should feel a tug on the hamstring. It shouldn't be extreme. This is just mainly to warm up the hamstring for that lengthening type of activity. And I would do both sides, spend about a minute or so doing it very slowly like this. Heel digs are an awesome way to start loading the hamstrings lightly after we've warmed them up and after a certain point of an injury. Notice that her knees are not really moving too much. It's gonna be your hips driving up and that's about it. She's holding the position. Now you might wonder when you start this, and this is very dependent upon the person's injury, but for the most part, I usually say about 72 hours after the injury, roughly, definitely around a week or so. And the reason is because we need the collagen within the tendon area to remodel. It's stimulated by a mechanical stimulus, which this is the reason why excessive rest does not really work on these things, and that's why you're looking for a video on it. We'll have a whole podcast on this. The Levitt exercise, named from Carl Levitt, is one where we start people in this 90s position. We have, uh, basically think of a sideways squat, and I'm going to have her breathe three deep breaths out. <laughs> Let's take a look at her trunk. We're looking to see if she's dropping the rib cage down mainly. That's why she has her hands right around the bottom of the cage, and you can see her breathing out. <laughs> Spend about a minute or so doing this. It might seem like it's not doing much, but it is a start on a process forward to stabilizing the midline. The wall bug is a great way to then put that levit exercise into place. So she's stabilized the trunk through the levit exercise. Now she's placing her hands on the wall. Notice the rest of her body is in the same position, and now she's doing more of a marching pattern, returning to the same position every time. The trick with putting the hands on the wall and why we like people to do it is because it tricks them into getting their trunk or pelvis into the right position. We do advance this typically into an exercise called the dead bug. Let's take a look from the side. Now just notice how quiet the rest of her upper or everything above her hips are. It should remain really stable. Oftentimes I put my hand behind the person's back and I tap them if I feel them lift up or move in any fashion. I want to see that they can keep the same position. Usually we have people do this from one to two minutes. If they need breaks, again, they can. It's all about how well you do it, not how often or how long. Now the next exercise is we call good mornings or an RDL pattern. I know I'm going to get comments on, hey, that's not a good morning. It's not a bar in her back. I get it. I got it. But what we're looking for is the hip displacement backwards. We're looking for the pattern that is typically shown in both of those activities. So what I usually have people do is start up high here, press their hips towards the back wall, slide their hands down the thighs to the knees and return. Their feet should be glued completely to the ground. Notice she's not rocking back and forth from her feet. It's very common for runners to not be able to do this pattern, which is a complex movement we need to learn how to do. If we're going to teach single leg RDLs and deadlifting, we need to learn this first. Spend time practicing. Actually, loading that lateral squat right there, I like to use a band right here attached to a, sorry, band right there attached to a yoga strap. There's a lot of things, different things you can use for this, but active, active loading of a movement is actually when we have 
a vector or a force driving into the movement, so you have to control the movement. You, you just can't have gravity just kind of plop you down into it. So I like active loading these type of uh, pattern. Now the lateral squat is really useful for knee stacking. And you're gonna notice here that she's actually doing it improperly. Okay, and this is what a lot of people end up doing, which I have a huge passion for them not, so this takes a lot of correction. Number one, let's move this thing out over here. Let's see if I can get it out of there. I'll move to the top. Okay, so the knee number one has to be in this straight line right here, okay? The hip, the knee, and the foot have to be able to drive this person up or to the right because we're working on change of direction type of patterns. Let's take a look at her now when she moves. So she has to drive straight up. The knee is in a poor pattern, but when you think about squatting, regular squatting, it's actually not bad because she has the knee over the foot. This is different. And notice here also the depth that she gets to. She's pretty flexible. We have this knee straight, which is what I want, but a lot of times people, when they um, squat back this far, they feel this hamstring or and or adductor light up. This is not an adductor stretch at all. It is not a full squat. It is a pattern into a lateral squat or change of direction. Imagine if you're running. We would run one direction, and then we would pivot and drive into the other. And that's what this is training here, to be able to be powerful in change of direction. Okay, I still don't like any of these squats here. I was going to coach her into a better one pretty soon here. So this one was really bad. So the knee drifted outside here. This is how we get turned ankles, okay? Let's see when she does correct. Uh, she has to lift. <laughs> uh, so this takes a little bit of time. So the first thing I like to do is actually like to have people think about the tripod in their foot. And if you have not seen a video on this, there's a point right here, one on the outside here, and one on the inner or the ball of the foot. Both sides need to be drilled into the ground the entire time. They cannot lose contact. Don't even let them change pressure. This is still drifting out and going definitely too far. Let's get her into the, there we go. Now she's starting to attain it. So notice here, so it's still not great. She has a little bit of uh, arching or the increase of the arch of the foot. The knee is not totally stacked in a line of drive, but I know pretty soon here she's going to really get it. Here we go, right there, good. Okay, so I'm gonna pause it right there. We can do a little correction on the foot here, but for the most part, this knee, it looks like a terrible squat. Granted, it looks like a terrible squat, but it's not a bad, it's actually a good lateral squat. All right, we're training a different movement. People ask me, why are we doing this? So we have this ball and socket right here, which is the hip socket. We typically train it in forward backwards movements, such as squatting, deadlifting, lunging, so on. But frontal plane, forward back, or uh, side to side, and rotationally, a lot of times it's not challenged. This is what we're doing here. So check that knee tracking. She has that vector of drive that she's getting back. She's clenching the cheeks at the top. And the torso or the pillar on top right here is staying stacked over the hips. So these look pretty good. That's a bad one, a really bad one. Let's look from the other angle. She's drifting a little bit again. Notice that the other foot is drilled into the ground. And let's get her into a better one. That's a bad one. Here's just a new view from the other side here. Okay. What I want you to notice here is actually she's getting her hips back and her knee is not tracking dramatically over her toes. When you do this, when the knee is tracking over the toes, you'll load the quad and you'll leave the hip out of it. This isn't 100% bad thing, but when we train this thing, I like, to, I like to oftentimes get the hip into it. So I like to push them back slightly so that their weight is into this heel back here. They're still driving those two other points right here, but majority of the weight's right here. And then they're gonna drive out of it, standing tall, clenching the cheeks. Now this is a video on our Nordic hamstring exercise, which is one which is highly publicized for hamstring strains. Now, I want you to keep in mind, I actually did a podcast recently with uh, Brennan Gassamia. Uh, I think it's going to be session number 72 on the Performance Play Sports Gear podcast. Uh, I'll put a link below. This is an extremely advanced exercise, and it is something that I typically, you're going to notice when I do it, that I lost my ability to hold it even up here, okay? A lot of times I'll put a bench like this one over here in front of people because they don't have the capacity to do it. And there's so much uh, workload on the hamstring, especially in an eccentric or lengthening fashion, that it just could tear you up, okay? Here's how we set up for it though when you're prepped and ready for it. So we have someone hold the knees, obviously something very squishy on the knee, or on the knees. They're gonna hold the ankles and you have to trust them because if they drop you, 
or if this person doesn't trust them, then you're not going to do it right. Notice that we have the only movement really comes from the knees, the hands catch, and now we have our solid pillar, and uh, we're not losing this position right here. So as I go down, I'm straight as a board. I don't lose posture. I don't bend forward. I don't extend back. And down here, I'm in the same exact posture, although I see some round there in the low back right there. Okay. To get up, I always tell people, I don't care how you get up, just as long as you have good posture. There shouldn't be... They shouldn't be rounding right here. They shouldn't be extending. They can do a push up and come back up if they want to. They can crawl back up like this. It does not matter because with this exercise, with the Nordic hamstring exercise, we're looking for this slow control of a lengthening contraction. Now right here, I'm going to show you that my form was not good right there. So you're going to see that I start to round when I'm coming up. Now, the reason why this is significant is because if you listen to the other um, podcast, then you're going to notice that sometimes hamstring quote-unquote injuries are actually disc injuries. They're actually spinal injuries, uh, non-traumatic spinal injuries, which create tightness into here. So this, in theory, if I did this, this could flare up the hamstring and set you off, and it would, it would not be an eventful exercise, although we'd be looking at the wrong diagnosis as well, which I see is very, very common. So I typically recommend people do this the people do this no more than six to eight times, okay? I like a descending pyramid, eight times, six times, four times, something like that. It is a, I can't stress this enough, it is an extremely high tension, eccentric exercise. Start slower than you think, do it less than you think, and start to build a volume. I usually don't recommend people more, do it more than two to three times a week, and it is very, very low volume. Now, with that being said, this right here, sorry for the, the thing at the bottom, this is poor movement. And you're going to see it throughout a lot of people that do this, okay? They don't have strength in the hamstring. They don't have ability to keep their torso stacked. So they're going to bend forward first, dropping the hips back, with, which is an absolute no-no. Absolute no-no. There's another poor one right there. That one's a better one. That one's a better one. And you notice this is a... Another way of getting back up. So I'm going to do a push-up on the way up. 